whatever. Uh, so let's start with Charlize. So how did this project originate? How did you first, you know, start with, how did, how did this come to you? It was sent to my company, Denver and Delilah, by um, Annapurna. And um, they said, would you guys be interested in producing this? And would you maybe want to play Megan? Uh, the first part of that was a no-brainer. We knew that this was an important story to tell right now, and as a company, that's always what we're looking for. The mother side took a little <laughs> took a little longer. Strangely, I was developing something with Jay Roach, and so I was seeing him every single day of my life for like a good three months there, and um, and he's just he's a friend that I just really trust and. Um, I gave him the script and I said, can you just like tell me what you, what you think about this? I'm having a really hard time wrapping my head around this idea of playing Megan. And he called me back like four hours later. <laughs> he was like, you have to do this. <laughs> and I was like, will you do it with me? <laughs> and that was really, that's how, how it all started. And how were you cast, Nicole? How, how did the project, did they call you and say, you remind us of a Fox News anchor? <laughs> Well, I keep thinking of To Die For, too, from the beginning of your career. There seems to be like a through line between To Die For and now this movie, Bombshell. Um, they, they called me and said, um, there's this really interesting um, project and Charlize is producing it, Jay's directing it, it's written by Charles, and I just went, wow. Um, I was in the middle of shooting Big Little Lies and um, I've, they, they know this story, so... Um, but I was, I was tired, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, things, things like this don't come along very often and I so wanted to work with Charlize for almost a decade. I'd obviously, um, wanted to work with Jay and Charles, but nothing had ever eventuated and, but I said to Meryl Streep, um, <laughs> just to name drop, wow. um, wow. <laughs> If you can do it. Wow. <laughs> um, should I play Gretchen Carlson? Um, and because I trust her taste. And, <laughs> um, and do you think, because a lot of it was I didn't think, I obviously don't look like her, and I just thought, as I, as I always do, I can think of 10 other actresses who'd be better. And she went, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And she said, because you need to be a part of something that marks a time in history. And, um, and that was when I went, yeah, that's so right. <coughs> and uh, this is always a question that gets asked, but did you, you play Roger Ailes, Mr. Lithgow, did you, ha I mean, you know, one always asks the question with, with people that are not necessarily the most appealing. Do you have to like the character? Do you have to feel some sort of empathy for the character? What was your, what's your process in that situation? Well, I loved the part. <laughs> I mean, whether I liked the character or not, it was, it was, uh, listen, when, when my agents called me and informed me that I'd been asked to play this with the two of them and Margot Robbie, I mean, they were already set. How many actors are out there? Can you imagine getting a phone call like that? Uh, I said yes before the end of the sentence without ever having. And also Jay and, and Charles were, it just was this extraordinary dream team. I knew it was going to be a fantastic project. I was completely, uh, I almost levitated. <laughs> and you know, Roger Ailes is a big man. Uh, I, uh, I thought it was in, insane being asked to play Roger Ailes, but I thought it was insane being asked to play Winston Churchill only two years before. And in both cases, I said it yes immediately. Uh, I guess just the outrageousness of the idea appealed to me. Uh, I loved the fact that it was a, a clearly it was a woman's film, uh -huh. uh, and and that it was you know. Uh, described it off the top of my head by some journalist who ambushed me at Sundance. It is, it's about uh, a, a, a lot of women, not just three, but about a dozen women responding in, in all sorts of different ways to a crisis, and I was the crisis. 
Uh, and uh, I was delighted. <laughs> I knew this was going to be good. So Charles, when you were writing this, yeah. did you, one of the things, and this is a question for Jay as well, and frankly everyone, one of the things that's most striking to me about the movie is that, uh, is the way you tackle the theme of Me Too and the fact that the sexual harassment issues are not dealt with in a very black or white manner, that there is complication to the story. Was that always your intention in terms it, of... It, yeah, absolutely. Um, I had a slight advantage in the sense that I finished the script before the Weinstein story broke. And then, of course, when Jay came on <coughs> and Charlize... A year was, before, was Well, it? no, it was just maybe... I finished it probably, you know, four or five months before the, 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 before that story broke. Sold it a year before. I did the outline a year before. Uh, so, so, you know, we... That, that we benefited from the fact that we were in, weren't in that discourse, basically, you know, when, when it happened. But yeah, I mean, I I love writing women. The only thing I like more than writing women is writing conservatives. So, I, so, <laughs> so <laughs> this is a dream project in a certain way, you know. Um, so so you know, I think for Jay and I both, um, you know, there, there's limits to what we can do individually, obviously, to address sexual harassment. But the, the, the thing we can do is we can put men inside of Kayla's heart in that room with Roger Ailes. Mm -hmm. That I can do. Mm -hmm. and, and I can put women inside Roger's head in that scene so that they know what's coming and how, it ha and how this happens. Mm -hmm. And that felt like a fairly rewarding thing to try and achieve, you know. And so that's what we set out to do. And Jay, did you have a sense that you were trying to tell a woman's story? Was it important to you to do it from that perspective? It was absolutely important that it was from the women's point of view. The story was so compelling um, from their point of view, particularly Gretchen when she first jumped off the cliff, as we describe it, because Fox was not a likely uh, antagonist for a woman to take on. It was run by one of the most powerful um, you know, titans of, of media, and it just seemed like, how what would what would that be like to risk everything? Risk never working in broadcasting again, which, by the way, she didn't. For she might, she just now recently started doing some documentaries, but you know, the the price to her was so high. To, so my empathy right away went to what she was up against, and then the, my empathy went to. What was it like to wonder if the other women were going to step up? And then, oh, and then what's it like from Megan's point of view, wondering if I should step up for two whole weeks? Yeah. You know, it, it, there was, it was not clear they, that enough women would step up to make a difference. So I just had an empathetic connection to them. And I, and I again, as a, as a man, uh, I don't think men talk enough about this stuff. And I think we should and that women should be safe at work and men are the problem you know and so it's 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 interesting to try to kind of own that as a as, as sort of a collective guilt and say how can i contribute something about that about you know and, and see if i can we can all we did it all together obviously the thing that charlize and i talked about in the beginning and i could see it in what charles was up to too but um it just seemed like uh an empathy uh, project, do you know? And, and we've had a number of men, a, a, a huge number of, it's just a, a sadly huge number of women have come up and told stories, but, but men have also come up after, we've had a lot of screenings and a lot of discussions and said, well, I just didn't know, I just didn't understand it. I didn't understand, and, and that, that was, that's, I mean, you know, that's amazing. And that's how, I, and that's what I went through. I didn't know. I thought I might know a little bit. The more we dove into this and, and, and experienced it through our actors on the set, uh, it was life-changing, you know. Um, so that's what, it, it, was, it felt worth it the whole way through. It was really... Well, I also thought it was interesting that the women, Charlize or Nicole, you can speak to this, are not shown as wallflowers. They're shown as ambitious women. <laughs> and even a bit competitive with each other, or competitive with the world, in, in a sense. And I thought that was very interesting, because you don't usually see that. Usually the women, oh, they get, there's a moment of sweet, you know, they, they go soft, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Was that something you looked for, or was that part of what was 
attractive to you in terms of playing the characters? Yeah, and it was just, it was in the story. It, uh -huh. You know, it wasn't like we were like, this would be a good idea. <laughs> this happened, and I think it's always, we've talked about this at Lens, I, I'm always so interested when we can have some kind of transparency of what it really is to be a woman, and it, all of the complexities, and <laughs> all of the fucked upness, all of the messiness, that's when we're telling the truth of who women really are. And in, in, this, in this story, which is not just one isolated case, it's very common that women, I think we all know, you know, when a man is ambitious, it's a good thing. When a woman is ambitious, it's, a, it's not so good. Right. She's probably a bitch. Yeah. Um, and we're taking that word back. You know what? It's like we get to. We're taking the polls. Yeah, we get, to, we get to say that word. You don't get to say that word anymore. But I do think it's um, that's still something that's systemically that's a problem. The, the way that we view women in the workplace, and that somehow it has to be so different if you're a woman versus a man. We all have the same. The, I relate to Megyn Kelly's ambition and her drive and her need to want to live her full potential. I can completely relate to that and, and then also how those qualities can be turned on you so quickly um, if you step just a little out of place. But, you know, yes, there's complexities in the fact that they didn't all come together and look after each other and they all had different circumstances. Megan's circumstances were so different from Gretchen Carlson's circumstances and all of that comes into play when you have to like think about something like this and Listen, the bottom line is like sexual harassment is not an easy conversation to have, mm -hmm. nor is it an easy choice to come forward and speak out because you're probably gonna get ostracized and you're probably gonna end up paying a huge price. Mm -hmm. But thank God we've had women who are strong enough to make that decision and to put themselves out there because without that, I don't think this conversation would be happening right now. I totally agree. And was it, was, go ahead. similar feeling when you were playing Gretchen Carlson? Did you feel that, I mean, I love, I really love the scene where she's like, Megan's never going to come out for me. And then there's the scene when Megan does come out for, for her. There is a kind of moment of uh, awareness. I wouldn't call it necessarily solidarity, but there is a sort of, you know, the right thing. Well, I think it becomes a moral issue. My sister just saw the film and she really dissected it so well. I wish she was up here. Um, <laughs> but she said, for one, it's entertaining, so it allows you in. But you really do see that, yeah, it wasn't like sisterhood, yeah. you know, oh, we've all got each other's backs. Everyone's got their own lanes and they're all sort of jockeying. They're also being, I thought what was really good, the way Charles wrote that scene when um, they come to my house and no women are stepping up. Right. Um, um, that it's because we were pitted against each other. Mm -hmm. And you see that um, in that image of standing in the elevator, the three of us. And there isn't that sisterhood. There isn't that, oh, I've got your back and don't worry, I'm going to protect you. I mean, it's a really, um, that image speaks so um, powerfully. So the complications of this story are, are, I found really compelling because I'm not so interested in a preachy um, scenario or a preachy film. I'm interested in having to get in there and put it together, but I respond viscerally. I go, it's not right. Mm -hmm. I don't want this to happen to my child. Mm -hmm. I don't want this to keep continuing in the world and how do we change it? And it is a nonpartisan issue. That's what, when you see these, you know, this film is meant to not just be, oh, okay, it's about Fox News. If it works, it works on a much right. bigger scale where it's about this has to stop in the world for it to be a much safer place for all of us. Ultimately. Uh, how, much, uh, how much research did you do, uh, Mr. Lithgow? Uh, it's and it's John. Uh, no, John. <laughs> and it's Lithgow. It's Sir Lithgow. Sorry. You played uh, Churchill. 
<laughs> I apologize. No, not at all. No apologies. I'll just call you John. As long as you don't Safer. pronounce it Kelsey Grammer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I've forgotten what the question was. <laughs> How much research did you do? Oh, re research. It's okay, you, research. you said a well, lot of things you, straight, though. Yes. <laughs> I feel the, much better now. The interest, no, no, please don't feel badly about that. Research. Uh, I should well, more it, it was For one thing, it was, it was difficult. I read uh, the Gabe Sherman book, of course, and I read a good deal of what Roger himself wrote. It's not, it was not easy to find a lot of video or audio uh, on Roger because he was reticent. He, he wanted his people out on screen. He didn't want to be seen himself. I think he had a horrible self-image. Is that my cell phone? Yeah, that's you, John. <laughs> um, Interrupting the, uh, I think that is my cell phone. His wife just saw the film as well. <laughs> Oh, well, she she did see it, and yeah, she was mortified, she, right? She was so stunned. I, I, she she's, she was traumatized. I, 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 I haven't had a chance to talk to her about it yet. I she's calling I, you right now. May have been. Uh, now I'm completely flummoxed. Oh yes, I there put in the stuff stuff I it. found a precious little three-second bit of film of Roger walking from a building to the car, just as you and I walked from the car to the building. Not, with the, not with the walker. Not, not with a walker, but he yeah. had this extraordinary lurching gait. <laughs> that was gold. It's all I could find. Uh, but the most remarkable uh, research I did, and I apologize to everyone on this stage, I'll be telling this over and over again, I found his business partner from the 1970s who was an old acquaintance of mine oh. who worked with him as his associate producer when he was trying to be a theater producer in New York. Roger Ailes produced the premiere production of Hot L Baltimore, amazingly oh, enough. Ladford Wilson. And, and yes, and he, uh, he also worked with him in the early stages of his life as a media consultant with political campaigns. And he had a completely different take on Roger. As much as he judged him for what eventually became of him, he felt it was a terrible injustice had been made that nobody acknowledged what an exuberant, charismatic, delightful man he was. He described being on the road on political campaigns with him and having late night drinks with him and laughing out of control for 40 seconds at a time. An exuberant man, uh, an edgy man with a great sense of humor. Now you take all that and you make that an element of it constructing this character, this old man, and that I mean, somebody had that opinion of him from 40 years before. That to me was fat. I couldn't wait to get to Jay. Remember that morning <laughs> uh, to tell him all these stories I'd heard about Roger, and it was very illuminating because nobody wants to be, behave as no. First of all, nobody thinks he or she are, be, are behaving with complete evil. Nobody wants to be the victim of a compulsion. And I, the, to me, the most fascinating thing about a, a, a character who is uh, sort of dismissively called the villain is he doesn't want to be the villain. He doesn't consider himself the villain in his own story. And he may not even, he, he may not even want to be in the grips of this compulsion. When I say thank you to Kayla, after she's done that, mm -hmm. he's made her do that appalling thing. Mm -hmm. And he says, have a seat, thank you. you. You have a great body. An extraordinary piece of writing by Charles. Yes. But to me, that line, you have a great body, I felt that it would be wonderful to color that with deep regret at what he had just done. Just to give some other, other facet to Roger, other than just this despicable man. But even in the not, I mean, I thought another really beautiful piece of writing is when he walks in and says to Gretchen Carlson, Miss America, Miss America, there's something really chilling and truly upsetting about, you know, it puts you in your place in two seconds. Mm -hmm. And it's very belittling and at the same time kind of 
let me tell you why you're here. It was, it's a very beautiful piece of writing. And, and what's also interesting is the scene um, with Charlize where she's explaining to her husband. Yes, um, it's true. Yeah. I like him. Yeah. He was good to me. He gave me those things because it's always complicated. Um, and that sort of, and this is where I think when you really access the brain of someone who's in this situation, where it's like, but I owe him so much. Um, yes, this has happened to me, but I owe him so much because he did do... It's very, very complicated, the, the labyrinth of the way in which that psyche works with, a, um, with the misuse of power and yet still having opportunity to have a job and being mentored and it's all, it's like it almost sort of in the wiring of the brain, it doesn't, you can't quite make compute it properly. I find now the complexity of that really important to state because I think many women um, or any gender who's been in a position of being abused with someone in, in, a, in a powerful position can, ha can fluctuate in that place. It's so true. Power of seduction. oneself too. Go ahead. The, no, I was just going to say the power of seduction is something that we don't, we haven't seen enough in characters like Roger Ailes, and I, I find that Megan was really, really, I think she, it was one of her biggest struggles because she did, he, he invested in her fully and gave her great advice, and she always admits that she is where she, she got where she ended up being because of him and because of his support and belief in her. But that power of seduction is, um, we're, we're hearing a little bit more of that now. It's not this idea of just assault, but it's this dance that happens for a really long time and before you know it, you're in a place that, that you can't even prepare yourself for. Right. It's, um, I think that's real danger. You know, we should say that we, we did have an opportunity to talk to quite a few people who are in that world and from that world. And one of the most fascinating the Fox world. Yeah, and one of the most fascinating things that Jay and I found, because writing Roger's a little complicated, because Roger's own rhetoric was a little not so interesting. So you had to kind of create fake conservative ideas for him, like his critique of the word bullying or his line about liberals want to live in a future that you know they're too lazy or um, what was it? What was the line? Lazier <laughs> something under, under to. I anyway, I can't remember my own line. I hit the. Uh, <laughs> but, I forgot it all. Uh, but you know, the, the, one of the things that we heard was that Roger had this way of seducing you by saying to to to, to young female, what it, it was pre-anchors, you know, women who, who aspire to be anchors, that you know, I just don't know. Men men do bad things, you know, and they have that killer, and that's word for word verbatim from from what we, this sort of so that so that he so that he had this premeditated pattern of seduction that he planned out and would use repeatedly. It was sort of fascinating insight into how, you know, how that works, right? It's just that, that he was marrying, and, you know, the job and the sexuality so seamlessly in this, in, in these situations. It was super fascinating for us. Um, Jay, on a technical level, was it difficult to sort of create this world? Was it difficult to sort of reinvent all of Fox News and you know, there's a wonderful office, chaotic, you know, it, it really feels alive in that way. And I noticed that a lot watching it the second time. Was it difficult to, because there's so much background stuff all the time, which is great. It, we had an incredible uh, production designer, Mark Ricker, who we took over to the uh, LA Times building in LA, which has been abandoned recently. Oh. And um, the whole film was shot in LA, sorry, New York. Uh, we tried to, we, uh, we hopefully did, you know, tried to, to put people in that world. but. <laughs> Um, we also, uh, it's always important to me on these films to, uh, to have the, uh, the amount of chaos in the frame, to have people be everywhere and, and, and broadcast. We, we went to extensive amounts of research to make sure every monitor, and there's hundreds of them, you know, sometimes in every shot, had an image that was from that actual day, you know, was from footage that was, and, and so that you always, you know, just were aware of the, the local tension that was going on with all the characters, but also the, the global, you know, cultural impact of what Fox News was doing, what 
what these people were all working within, which I think added a lot of layers. I tried to make a lot of things go on simultaneously. Uh, um, and Charles was with me, you know, the whole time uh, right next to me. I love having writers with me and, and constantly saying, does this seem real to you? Does this seem real to you? That was a, it was such a collaboration with all of us. Actually, Charlize was always around. Every, you know, we, we, we had so many great producers and creative people that we were constantly um, checking in with each other to, to just go for the, off, the most authentic possible version of everything, all incredible costumes from Colleen Atwood, you know, just an amazing... Uh, the costumes are like a life of themselves. Yeah, and the, and so we the have... Costumes, <laughs> the costumes are so fascinating to me because it's about fashion as a kind of fembot movement. I mean, they, they take these really remarkable looking women and turn them into an army, exactly what he wanted them to be. I mean... Was his projection, I, I pitched it when I first went in and said, I see it as like a cult of personality where someone is projecting what, you know, it is the male gaze to use that sort of academic feminist phrase, but it is men projecting not only what he kind of uh, fantasizes would be the per perfect deliverer, deliverer of news, but also what he knows the audience would respond to and in a perfect marketeer kind of way, cram women into, literally into the spanks and the look and the hair, the wigs, and uh, it was his dollhouse, you know, and that's why we, we very deliberately, you know, made a thing of the elevators as women in boxes, and uh, there's a sound design that goes with that, which is kind of like the sound when you see on a cop show when people are going through the prison processing cells, you know, and cha -ching, cha -ching, so that the sounds are always made to be uh, a manifestation of Roger's psyche, a contr a bo both con a control thing and a power thing, but also an entitlement thing. I'm entitled to all this. I, I it is the classic male uh, sort of, you know, narcissistic, misogynistic, sin I'm the most important person here. Everybody owes me loyalty and owes me uh, not just professional <coughs> obligation, but also affection and laughing at my jokes and um, sexual, th and so, and then when that's violated, then it's like, you know, unleash the, the character assassination hounds. I mean, it is a cult. It's very much like any classic, uh, and it's not unique to Roger Ailes. It's Harvey's way. It was. It's to some extent a lot of a lot of people in politics and uh, corporations um, create this kind of organization of power centered on one person. It's ter it's terrifying, and I thought revealing that would hopefully make us more likely to question it and stand up to it. I also thought you, yeah. yeah can, I just, can I just say one quick thing? So in the end, there's a great song that is a brand new song written by Regina Spector, and it's called One Little Soldier. It's a totally original song, and Regina's here tonight, I think, if you are. Oh. Regina, oh, she's, there, she's there, she's there. And, um, she watched the film in my living room, and I, I had a secret, you know, hope that something might click when she saw it, but I was never sure she would want to or what, and she was so moved by it. She and her husband Jack were there, and, and my wife was there, and we were all kind of crying. I mean, it was a very emotional night just in our, and three days later, she just called me up and said, would you listen to something I know might be, and, I, and we, she, we listened to it on her phone, with my, my wife and I with our two headphones, <laughs> and we were, we were just like going like this, and we, were, we both looked at each other, and we were, it was the most amazing um, crystalline kind of, I don't know how to explain, just, it just got the, it took Charles' script and just, she just channeled it into this one, and then we had that animation of women in boxes, that's what made me think of it, is, the whole idea of Roger manipulating, and it, and the, but it all it takes is one little soldier, you know, um, to to knock it all down, and that's that was all Regina, that and that's that's I actually shot a, I hope someday we can use it. We shot a, a little piece of, of Nicole lip syncing to the one little soldier, which will, which will someday in some some way. Will. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to to tip my hat to Regina Spector, the amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, I was going to say something else, but now it seems so small. I was just going to say that there's a wonderful feeling of paranoia <clears throat> that you 
created in that office space. It does feel like, like the woman who, I didn't notice this the first time I saw it, but the second time, the woman who works for you, the dark haired woman, you can't tell whether or not she's had an incident or not. And the whole time you're sort of thinking, uh, maybe something happened to her, but she doesn't, whether, was that intentional that, no, okay. <laughs> no, but, it's, but, um, uh, but, but a couple of other people have said that, and it's, I think it's what happens when nobody knows what's going on, nobody knows who's been, it's like, it's like that reverse of that game Werewolf or Mafia where you sit around and close your eyes and you don't know who's, who are the villains. In this case, you don't know who are the victims. And no, the women didn't know who among the others was, and that's one of the things that Megan did that I thought was remarkable was collect names and help people find each other, which she, she did do with the weather lady. With the weather lady. <laughs> it's true that, that actually happened. Janice Dean. Um, Charlize, did you stay in character the entire time? Did you stay in I'm voice? still in character. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, no. That was, she, yeah, that was exhausting. Um, I actually, I, I hurt my vocal cords pretty badly trying to speak, and she speaks really fast as well, and in the very deep register, and I had spent hours with this incredible woman, Carla Meyer in Los Angeles, who helped me get her, around her voice a little bit, and I had to take three weeks off because I like busted my vocal cords trying to, so no, I was definitely not, not that I ever, I don't know how people stay in character, I'm too lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta like raise kids and I have dog shit to pick up, like I, I don't know how you do that in character. I, it's, it's exhausting, it's so fucking exhausting. You didn't stay being Gretchen Carlson then, I'm guessing. Um, no, but I did um, have to stay in a rhythm. She speaks in a particular rhythm, which I had to sort of absorb. Obviously, I'm Australian, so I had to really listen and absorb her, um, the rhythmic way in which she um, speaks. It was very, very different. Oh, and I did... Yeah. Um, <laughs> Baby! No, it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> We're breaking so hard here. My life is go so down. hard. Um, <laughs> But I have stayed in character for different characters. It depends on what um, is needed. <laughs> um. And John, you stayed as Roger. Oh, he's still out here. I'm still. Oh, yeah. Every time you saw him, he was like, well, I... he was after us. <laughs> this is just not true. Teasing. You know, I, I had this fantastic fat suit. All I needed to do was put on the fat suit, not to mention the two and a half hour long makeup, Kazuhiro Tsuchi's brilliant makeup. I, that's, 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 this is the same way he did Darkest Hour. Yeah, this was the great irony. This was the great irony that he made up Gary Oldman as Winston Churchill with all, with all these extraordinary prosthetic devices. As Winston Churchill, I didn't have any prosthesis at all. <laughs> Turns out I look much more like Winston Churchill than I realized. <laughs> uh, but I mean, when I was, I was, I was effortlessly in character as soon as I put all that stuff on. Colleen Atwood was my, she was my uh, co-conspirator. It was just, we spent hours and hours getting that big fat body right. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you look very closely, halfway through the shooting, we decided that he really needed man boobs. <laughs> so I feel that. I was always very frustrated. Then we got to the point where we said, well, it depends on his mood. <laughs> but in some scenes, he has man it's boobs. It's all in the details. In some scenes, he doesn't. <laughs> Roger Ailes with the man boobs than without well, the man the, boobs? Well, the fat suit it, it, it is what did it. I, I now use them for pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> so you, have you ever done that much prosthesis before? Is this the first uh, time? No, it was by far the most. I've done bits and pieces. And I was very skeptical. I, you know, remember I argued against it. Uh, but I, you know, in deference to Jay and this genius uh, Kazu, I said, okay, I'll, let's do it. Let's give it an entire day. Let's let's have a look. And I was just astonished by it. Uh, I mean, that prosthesis. There are six pieces put together: two jowls, 
one huge double chin, a different nose, and two fat earlobes. And it blends so completely with my own face. Uh, I go like this, and my, my <laughs> waddle like a turkey. And the, uh, like, the wrinkles, I would wrinkle my face, and the wrinkles in the prosthetic would cohere with the wrinkles on my face. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how they do this magic. And it was really great. And, and, and by the way, I mean, it was makeup. Look at, look at Richard Kind as Rudy Giuliani. <laughs> And, and Geraldo Rivera and, and Bill O'Reilly. Bill O'Reilly was very impressive. I was amazing. Bill O'Reilly was really impressive. Yeah. And it sure. wasn't just duplicating or making them resemble uh, the subject. Well, the I first time I saw a... Charlize, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> you were very rude, actually. <laughs> I couldn't. You walked right by me. You didn't even say hi. <laughs> I was shocked. I was up close and she was Megan. I could not see Charlize in there. And that's astounding. So, yeah. It's a Kazu, than, not me, Kazu. No, it's oh, Kazu, Kazu, say, but it's, it's more, performance. It's, more than makeup. it's yeah, performance, it's more than... it really is. So. <laughs> wrap up of getting like weird high signs and stuff and they're turning out the lights so I, I'll leave I'll give Jay the final word which is you did an amazing job you made an amazing film and how do you feel now that it's over <laughs> so it's I will tell you it's emotional I, I've seen it a thousand times my wife Susanna who's here Susanna Hoffs is here and, who I grew up with she uh, we are she, we, we all grew up with we, her. Yeah. Oh, I really grew up with her. Yeah. She, I was just sitting with My her My sister's again. roommate in college. I, I feel like women, I've sit with her, she never, ever, there's never been a screening where she wasn't beginning to, to sob, you know, part way through it. She, she's seen it a thousand times, and I, and I always sort of see it through her eyes when I'm watching, and I, I don't know, again, I just, it's that, it's just that, point of view thing, which I thought was always so incredible in the script, which we always made. It's just like, can you, can you, I, I worked with Douglas Adams, the guy who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide many years ago, and he invented a device that wasn't in the book for the film, it was called a POV gun. And it's an actual gun that he would, you would equip soldiers to take into war, but what would happen instead of firing at the enemy and, and a bullet would come out, as soon as you fired the bullet, you would see the world from the, your enemy's point of view. It was called a point of view gun. And then what would happen is they'd pull the trigger and they would go, oh. And they would all put down their guns because they now, once they saw the world, and I just think once you see the world from a woman who has to face, uh, who just can't, can't trust a boss or a colleague just to go to work, and you, and you also see a point of view of a man like Gil, the producer, who has to decide, am I gonna believe the accusers and support them, or am I just gonna you know, question them and doubt them, and, and what's that dilemma like? That, that's, that's storytelling, and that, we got to do that, and that's so humbling and moving to me that we got to be part of this and you know it, and it all started with this I, seriously the script it really was but that's that's, that's my thank you thank you all for coming and really, uh, really